If we seek one word to describe the essence of the High Holy Days, teshuva is the one word. Tradition teaches that before God created this world, and all worlds, God created teshuva. The question is, why? Typically and rightfully, we associate the word teshuva with repentance. Yet, like so many Hebrew words, teshuva is overlaid with meaning that requires several different translations into English. The word teshuva, per se, does not appear in the Bible, but its root, shuv, repent, is all but ubiquitous from the first book to the last book, from Genesis to Second Chronicles. Rather, teshuva itself appears in the Bible only in the construct form in conjunction with the word shana, year, as teshuvat hashana, meaning turn of the year. Thus, teshuva also means turn, turn toward, turn about, or turn back. In this sense of teshuva, we turn back to Temple Emmanuel's High Holy Days of 1980, 5741, specifically to the Slichot service. Those High Holy Days were not only my first at Temple Emmanuel, but the Slichot service was also my first as a rabbi, since my first pulpit in Philadelphia did not have any Slichot observance. Of course, of course, Slichot is not a holy day, but it can serve as a preview of Aseret Yemei Teshuvah, the Ten Days of Repentance. The combination of firsts, my first here at Temple Emmanuel, and my first Slichot service as a rabbi, made me doubly excited. But Temple's beloved senior rabbi, William Sagewitz, a blessed memory, was even more excited. Rabbi Sagewitz had created a unique motif for Slichot, a formal service followed by an artistic performance with a contemplative theme leading to the Holy Days. For that Slichot, Rabbi Sagewitz invited Bon Yeshur to perform here. Bon Yeshur was a renowned composer of more than 300 liturgical compositions. You are likely most familiar with his Kadusha. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Bon Yeshur also published arrangements for traditional prayers, including the Zochrenu, which Sierra, Neil, and Rebecca have performed so beautifully throughout our high holy days. Bonya not only accepted Rabbi Sagewitz's invitation, he also offered to bring an entire troupe of musicians and dancers to perform a modern dance interpretation of the relationship between Rachel and Leah, one of several tangled relationships between siblings in Torah. Bonya, in fact, offered it as the production's premiere, starring his wife, Fanshan, as choreographer and prima dancer. Rabbi Sejewitz was delighted to accept Bonya's fulsome offer. For me, that slichot was a dazzling introduction to Temple Emmanuel. The modern dance rendition of Rachel and Leah's relationship captured both the rivalry and the bonds of love between the sisters. Rachel, the more beloved wife, and Leah, the more fertile, fruitful mother. I had never before seen anything in a synagogue that could be called avant-garde, but this was it, and I loved it, especially for the creative, contemporary way it brought Torah to life. Following the dance performance, Bonya gathered all of us in a great circle around the social hall. He joined all of us together by passing a long rope into everyone's hand. He then taught us a song, along with choreography, with the rope. I will do what I can. Everything is connected. Everything is connected. Accompanied by the musicians and joined by the dancers, we repeated this verse over and over, mantra-like, 
raising and lowering the rope, all flowing in unison. Altogether, it was joyful, uplifting, and even transcendent. I walked out of temple that night believing that I had come to a synagogue that could tap the depth and breadth of human existence, a synagogue where community bonding coalesces with personal discovery, where the ancient Torah is ever new and vibrant. These are counted among Judaism's immeasurable blessings. Well, maybe not quite. When I walked into temple the next morning, Rabbi Sejewitz hurried me into his office. His phone had been ringing late into the night and then early that morning. Certain temple members at Slikhot were aghast at the women dancers' attire, leotards and scarves. Moreover, these members were speechless that the dancers reenacted childbirth, twice for Rachel and five times for Leah, not artfully, they believed, but too realistically. Any notion I had about avant-garde vanished. In the rancor, no mention was made of those moments of religious bliss we had all shared singing, I will do what I can. Everything is connected. Nonetheless, such moments cannot and will not ever vanish. You can find them almost anywhere, sometimes in surprising places, as I did recently on a jar of salsa. Printed on the label right above refrigerate after opening was the following. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. But these moments of profound understanding are more easily found in a branch of Torah that our tradition calls Kabbalah. Like teshuva, the Hebrew word Kabbalah has layers of meaning. Today, when we pay a bill in Israel, we are given a Kabbalah, a receipt. Kabbalat Shabbat, receiving Shabbat, is our ritual to welcome Shabbat. Bride and groom welcome one another under the chuppah with Kabbalat Panim, literally receiving faces. In Jewish tradition, Kabbalah means precisely that, tradition. Of course, you may know Kabbalah as Jewish mysticism, but the word Kabbalah itself is devoid of mysticism. Think of Kabbalah as Torah, as Judaism has thought since Kabbalah first emerged from Torah centuries ago, just as Talmud, Midrash, and Judaism's vast library of sacred literature all have emerged from Torah over the centuries. Gershom Sholem, the renowned scholar on Kabbalah, acknowledged that he began his exploration of Kabbalah to prove that mainstream Judaism has always been guided by strict rationalism and logic, while Kabbalah has always been a fringe element. Credit to Sholem's intellectual integrity. His studies soon convinced him otherwise that Kabbalah often indeed has been mainstream Judaism. What Kabbalah proposes is to answer questions which elude rationalism and logic. When you think rationally and logically about what Kabbalah proposes, it makes total sense. Have you ever taken note of the quote on the dedicatory wall of the Rabbi Sejewitz Endowment Fund in Temple's upstairs foyer? Since its inception in 1985, with Rabbi Sejewitz's retirement, the fund has been the lifeblood of Temple's programming. The quote on the wall is by Albert Einstein. It embodies the fund's mission. Imagination is more important the knowledge. Einstein then continued, for knowledge is limited to all we know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world 
and all there will ever be to know and understand. In 1925, Einstein was walking with a young physics protege, Esther Salomon, when he mused, I want to know how God created this world. I want to know God's thoughts. The rest are just the details. Kabbalah imagines God's thoughts. Among God's thoughts, centuries ago, Kabbalah imagined that this world is but one of God's many worlds. Science finally began to catch up to Kabbalah in 1992, thanks to the Hubble telescope. In the ensuing decades, exploring only a tiny region of our Milky Way galaxy, the Hubble telescope has identified some 4,000 exoplanets, as planets beyond our solar system are called. Our Milky Way galaxy includes upwards of 400 billion stars, and our galaxy is but one of perhaps two trillion galaxies in the universe. And such are God's thoughts in Kabbalah, that every world orbiting every star in every galaxy is connected to our world. Moreover, centuries ago, Kabbalah imagined a universe of universes, for such is the infinite power of the one God Kabbalah called Ein Sof, the Infinite One. Once again, science only recently caught up to Kabbalah with theorizing, imagining, that the countless black holes in our universe actually bubble out into other universes, creating a multiverse. Imagine the creation of such a multiverse. Now imagine the God who created our minds to imagine such a creation. This is not to suggest that imagination supplants or supersedes science. God forbid, not merely out of respect for all the benefits science has brought to the human condition and the many contributions of Jewish scientists in particular, but also for Judaism's appreciation that the more we understand God's creation, the more we understand God, the creator. But imagination can supplement science. Practicing what he preached, Einstein, Einstein himself is a perfect example. After experiencing that brief sensation of weightlessness all of us experience when an elevator starts to go down or stops going up, Einstein imagined an entire physics lab going up and down in an elevator. So began his investigation into gravity leading to his Nobel Prize for his general theory of relativity. Imagination also supplements far more than science. The very name the Kabbalists coined for God, Ein Sof, the Infinite One, inferred an obvious question. If God is infinite everywhere, where can there be room for the universe? indeed a multiverse. So Kabbalah imagined God's imagination. God made room for the universe, the multiverse, by an act of tzimtzum, self-contraction. God's self-contraction, tzimtzum, then followed with emanation, atzilut. By the cycle of contraction and emanation, God created our universe, and ultimately God's raison d'etre for creation. Us, humans, created in God's own image. The Kabbalists called this Hishtal Shelut, the chain of evolution. If contractions sound like childbirth, that is intentional. But Kabbalah intends them not as an anthropomorphization of God, attributing human likeness to God, but as a power, powerful, palpable dimension of divinity attributed to our physical existence. For good reason, we say that childbirth is a miracle on earth. 
So Hishtal Shalut, this chain of evolution from the infinite to the finite, is more than merely physical. It is also spiritual and ethical. It is supremely impassioned as well, expressing God's love, and it continues moment by moment. Each emanation conveys God's sublime superabundance, God's shefa in Hebrew. God's shefa is a combination of wisdom and understanding, justice and compassion, beauty and grace, might and glory, eternity and the world all together as the manifestation of God's will and God's love. All of this shefa emanates from God's love to fashion us in the image of God with free will. God blessed us with free will so that, like God, we can imagine. Like God, we can create. Like God, we can love. From my treasure chest of memorable moments here at Temple Emmanuel, here is another memory. Lisa Devoren and her son Sam approached me after the Shabbat service right before Rosh Hashanah 2010 which coincided that year with Sam's eighth birthday. Sam had a question, and his body language let me know that it was troubling him greatly. Why does God let bad things happen? In good Jewish fashion, to answer his question, I asked Sam a question. Which would your mother prefer, to ask you to do something or to make you do it? Ask me to do it, Sam answered. And which would you prefer, I then asked Sam, to do something because your mother asks you or makes you? Asks me, said Sam. And which is more loving for both you and your mother, asking you or making you? Asking me, answered Sam. I then explained to Sam that this is exactly what God thought in giving us the mitzvot and through us giving the Ten Commandments to the whole world. Did God have the power to make us keep the mitzvot and the commandments? Of course. But because God loves us, God asks us to keep them, not makes us. Do we, in turn, have the power not to keep the mitzvot along with the Ten Commandments? We certainly do. We have free will. In a way, free will makes us more powerful than God. So as God asks us, not makes us because God loves us, it is equally loving of us for God that we keep the mitzvot and the Ten Commandments with our free will. As God first imagined it, Creation is perfect, shalem in Hebrew, the quintessence of shalom, peace. Shefa emanates continuously, eternally upon all existence. Wisdom and understanding, justice and compassion, beauty and grace, might and glory, eternity and the world altogether as the manifestation of God's will and God's love. Everything is connected in heavenly, holy harmony. The Kabbalists chose the ideal name for such a place, Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. But something went terribly awry. Kabbalah has several theories of what went wrong. The theory that should resonate the most with all of us, especially today, happened, as we might expect, and God Aden. God asked the Torah's prototypes for all humankind, Adam and Eve, not to do something, and they went ahead and did it. They ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and bad. Perhaps God was simply testing them. If it truly was the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and bad, then why did they behave so badly after eating the fruit? So
such a question brings us to another meaning of teshuva, the paramount word for Yom Kippur. Teshuva also means answer. The question Teshuva answers is the one that God asked Adam and Eve after they did exactly the opposite of, God, of what God had asked. Where are you? But Adam and Eve did not respond to God's question with the right answer. The right answer is Teshuva in the sense of repentance. For starters, if they had answered that what they had done was bad, it would have been good. Teshuvah begins with acknowledging wrongdoing. Instead, our human prototypes engaged in subterfuge, playing the blame game, and obscuring the truth with alternate facts. According to the Kabbalists, this is when everything went awry. The sublime Shefa, sustaining life in Gan Eden, was shattered by the Pesha, the transgression committed therein. Shefa, spelled Shin Fei Ayin, was undone by the same three letters now spelling Pesha, Pei Shin Ayin, transgression. And because everything is connected, the world, the universe, the multiverse broke. Shvirah in Hebrew. And now Teshuva can answer the question I began with. Why did God create Teshuva before God created the universe? God imagined the risk in granting humankind free will. Free will grants the power to destroy, as well as create, to deceive, as well as imagine, to be selfish and violent, as well as generous and kind, to hate, as well as love in our thoughts and our deeds. Perhaps this was why the forbidden fruit may have been only a test to see how free will works because anything less than free will would have been much less than love on both parts, God's and humankind's. So before God created this world, God created Teshuva as a backup plan, a safety net, a life preserver. Teshuva proves that God is ever ready to walk the final mile with us and more. Teshuva gives hope that wrongs can be righted. Teshuva gives healing that pain can be relieved, regrets softened, remorse soothed. It all depends on how we answer the same question God asked Adam and Eve. Where are you? Where are you is God's way of asking us life's greatest questions. Why are we here and why now? Does each one of us have a unique destiny and individual responsibility to fulfill with this gift of life? And God, where are you? All of the answers are found in the final meaning of teshuva. Return. Why are we here? Because God needs us. Why now? Because God knows this beautiful world is broken in so many places. Whether or not Adam and Eve broke this beautiful world, they are not here to fix all the ways the world is broken today. We are here now. And everything is connected. So we must do what we can to fix it. This is our God-given destiny and God-given responsibility. This too the Kabbalists knew. The Kabbalists gave it a name you likely know. Tikkun Olam. We should take pride that our reform movement has long been identified with Tikkun Olam as our social action agenda. 
but the Kabbalists intended much more in calling us to tikkun olam. Tikkun olam means literally repairing the universe. Kabbalah teaches that God created each one of us for a specific purpose in tikkun olam. The impact of everything we do, everything we say, everything we think and everything we feel extends to everything else in this world and every other world in God's creation. We are free to live our lives as we please, but God asks us to remember our God-given purpose and return to the unique personal role for each one of us in tikkun olam. This is teshuva, meaning return. This is also teshuva, meaning answer, for it answers the greatest of all our questions. Where are you, God? Jewish tradition teaches that one who destroys a single soul destroys an entire universe, and one who saves a single soul saves an entire universe. Each one of us is a unique universe. God's magnificent multiverse begins here on Earth with some eight billion universes. Each person created in God's image with free will. Every person possessing a part of heaven, a soul. And everything is connected. So Teshuvah has the answer to the question, where are you, God? God is all around us, at least to start. And relative to the Ain Sof, the infinite one, in some small yet oh so precious and utterly irreplaceable part. Another answer to this question is in a Hasidic parable. A young Hasid asked Menachem Mendel the Kotzka Rebbe, Where is God? The Rebbe answered, Wherever you let God in. Now, Tzimtzum, God's self contraction, is more than Kabbalah's theory of cosmogenesis. With Tzimtzum, God becomes the consummate role model for all who aspire to live up to being created in God's image, to let God into our lives and to meet our individual responsibilities for tikkun olam. In order to connect, we need to contract. Selfless people are the best cure, the only cure for a selfish world. Teshuva begins our return to Gan Eden. Please, please do all that you can, because everything is connected. We return. We
Thank you.